sense, but he's here to be, to correct me where I veer off. He's the brains behind the wonderful tool that I need to elucidate more of your project. Well, then I will, uh, you know, he doesn't have to be on video, but uh, I'll uh, give him co-hosting privileges so that he can turn his camera on and off or uh, mute himself as necessary. Great. Okay, let's get started. Um, thank you, everyone, and welcome to the April 2024 meeting of the Hadley School Committee. Do I have a motion to open the meeting? So moved. Second it. Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Terrific. Thank you. Um, we are moving forward uh, first with any adjustments to the agenda. Annie, do you want to take us through that? Sure. Uh, one, I would request that after the presentation on the field trip that Mr. Burns will give the school committee that we invite Sarah Ross uh, to present, which is item 4D. So we just move that right afterwards to respect their time. Go from A to D and then we can go in order from there. Um, what's been added to the agenda uh, under donor recognition, also uh, continue the discussion of HES playground. I've added the resource, the district policy FF which is on the last agenda, and I've added information on school choice enrollments. Those are the only adjustments. Great, thank you. All right, uh, moving then into public comment. Um, this is a time where members of the public can uh, comment for up to three minutes on any of the items uh, pertinent to the agenda. Um, if you're interested in making a comment, please raise your digital hand and we will unmute you. Okay, seeing none, we will continue with presentation and discussion items. The first item up for discussion is the approval of the Hopkins Academy field trip to Europe in 2026. And here to tell us a bit about that is Professor Burns. Good evening. Um, if I sound weird, I'm, I'm home with COVID. Yay. Oh, All right. sorry um, to hear that. I think so I got it on the German subway. <laughs> um, Hope you feel better soon. Yeah, I'm already getting better. Um, I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit about the trip we just got back from. Um, we had 31 students attend um, and six, uh, six staff, and it was Rome to Munich. And we, I am so glad we switched to this company because it was phenomenal. Um, in Rome, we were a one subway stop from the center of Rome. Um, so we were able to get places quickly. In Innsbruck, we were a five-minute walk from the center. In Florence, we could see the Duomo from our hotel, and it was about a three-minute walk up to the central square. Um, Munich, we had a slightly further um, subway ride, but it was still very reasonable. And what's nice about that is we were able to give the kids a little more freedom in the evenings to explore and to see things and really immerse in the culture. Um, and they had a blast. Um, frankly, there were a lot of tears by chaperones and students when we get home because we didn't want to come back. Um, so I, while I know this company is more expensive, I think, I think it was worth it big time. Um, and one of the meals were phenomenal. The hotels were phenomenal. Um, and the immersion activities, the Bavarian dancing, we learned how to do Bavarian dancing. There are videos out there that you'll probably see eventually to our chagrin. Um, we just had a blast. Um, so our, our next one, we like to get them on the calendar right away to give families as long as possible to be able to, to sign up and make payments. Originally, we looked at Spain and Morocco, and we realized we, we've changed our minds, and there's a couple quick reasons I can share why. One is cost. Um, we realized that we were trying to move to February, so we don't always hit baseball and softball, but some very helpful people pointed out to us that February break is when basketball tournament usually is. So that's 
we can't control that. Um, whereas April break, we're early in the seasons and the AD can be much more forgiving when it comes to scheduling things. And we don't want, we, we didn't want to exclude all the kids that play basketball because they might have a great season. Um, by switching to April, the cost for Spain and Morocco went up significantly and higher than we even were comfortable with. And as we looked for further into travel times, everything on that tour took five to six hours to travel between, which meant we were going to spend the equivalent of an two whole days, two whole days on planes and two whole days on buses. And we were like, we're not going to ask families to pay $5,000 to sit on a bus and a plane. Um, so we started looking at other options. And what we've come up with is Venice to Prague. Um, although we may switch it to Prague to Venice, we, we're working working out those details. Because um, we realized with this trip, the Italians are still laid back and the Germans are not. Um, we love Germany, but it would have been better to start in Germany and then ended in the chill place. <laughs> um, but anyway, so the I believe the cost of this one before discounts and everything is $5,400. It's 10 days. That includes everything, including tips. It's a nice thing this company does. I don't have to carry 3,000 euros with me to tip everyone. They just take care of it. Um, there's a window if families sign up early they get i think it's a 300 dollars discount most of our people signed up that early last time um they can make monthly payments um they have uh money to help families it, it's in the materials there somewhere um who are lower incomes and we are going to try this time to do some fundraising um to defray at least the cost of maybe the bus to the airport um what makes it hard is because the kids signed up in such staggered things it's hard to fundraise with five kids that have signed up um so we're going to kind of do our fundraising separate from the kids and just kind of target the general community and say we're raising money for international travel um maybe do some we're right now we're thinking of doing some trivia nights or something um with the hope of raising enough to cover the bus to the airport because buses to airports cost a lot of money indeed they do thank you jason it was a delight hearing about this most recent trip and uh, i can't wait to see some of the video videos and photos that you're referring to uh, and thank you for taking into consideration some of that um that extra time that would have uh, been required uh, in the Morocco trip and designing something that is a little bit more friendly. Um, we've we've we're at that point in uh, in inflation and 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 pricing where we've exceeded that 5K barrier, haven't we? Yes. Um, and that is, uh, I can imagine that that might be that might feel daunting to some, but um, you you've shared a bit about the some of the fundraising strategies. Generally speaking, what is the philosophy if there's a family that's, you know, it's got a pretty big gap? Uh, do, you know, how do we get there? Is there it, it just, I would love a little bit of your uh, wisdom and uh, how we try to make that happen for everyone. I can, I'm going to defer to Annie because I know she's <laughs> working on this. <laughs> yeah, right. Jason, so we are in communication. I know this is a priority for the school committee and for our teachers. They don't want cost to be a barrier. However, um, and with that in mind, I'm working right now with the school committee's attorney to see what options are available um, in terms of um, having uh, financial aid type programs, what those should look like. And so I'm working with the attorney to come up with uh, procedures for that that she's approved. So I don't have those right now, but we have to, there's a lot to take into consideration um, in terms of making sure that it's completely fair and everybody has access to it. Um, once we have those procedures landed on, I will bring those before the school committee. They don't require school committee vote, um, but it's just so the school committee can weigh in and ask additional questions. Great, thank you, Annie. Sure. Any other- if, Can I add one more thing? Yes, I just wanted to add, there are cheaper companies um, we used to go with EF, 
And the reason I switched was because the last trip to France, frankly, we stayed at some truck stops um, in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I didn't feel comfortable safety wise, but also there was literally nothing but a McDonald's and a hotel and the highway. And I'm like, families, while it may be cheaper, what kind of experience is that? You're sending your kid to Europe. You don't want them staying at a truck stop. Yeah, really good call on that. Thank you. Any other questions for um, Jason Burns or uh, Annie on this trip? Mr. Burns, I was just curious. The, the, I saw that there's the option for college credit through George. Yes. Nathan. That's pretty cool. Do you know if any of the students are going to? I do not know. I I had some parents ask me, and I think it may already be included in their price. Like it's I have to double check that. Yeah. Um, I've been encouraging if they. The main part of the work is go on the trip, yeah. and then they just have to do a few little assignments. Gotcha. It's cool. That's excellent. Yeah. Of course, as always, if you're short of chaperone, let me know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we never seem to struggle finding chaperones I, I yeah I, I figured that but I'll, i figured i'd just throw my hat in the ring okay, there thank you um and then just you know make sure that enough people and you know come in to the meeting and let us know what you have going on for uh, fundraising so that you know we can get as much community support as possible because you know i think people are really in favor of helping kids get you know, get to go on those trips. Yeah, I will uh, keep you posted. Great. Any further discussion? All right. I'll entertain a motion to approve the um, 2026 field trip as presented. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, hey, Mr. Burns, and also Mr. Burns was scheduled to um, present, but even the topic's still a great one when we get to the open house agenda. I don't know, given how you're feeling, but when we get to the open house agenda, um, Senora and Mr. Burns had put together a workshop for families on service learning and international travel opportunities when you attend Hopkins. So thank you also for doing that, Mr. Burns. We appreciate it. You're welcome, and thank you. Thanks. Thank you, and feel hope better. you feel better soon. Thank you. It It's getting better already. Great. All right. Okay, we're going to move next to item D, health benefits of Hopkins Academy retrofit. And for that, we have Sarah, Unra Sarah Ross of um, Undaunted K-12. Great. Thanks for having me back again to see you all. Always nice to see this group. Are you all seeing my screen now? Yes. Great. Um, so I continue to be very excited about the work that you guys are moving forward on your facilities, and I continue to talk about the great work that you're doing to others across the state and the country, and I continue to think about you as I travel the world, and one of those moments was when I ran into this new great tool that the Harvard School of Public Health, along with some collaborators at Boston University and Oregon State, uh, Brian's going to correct me if I'm wrong on any of that, put together um, to help building owners understand the health and climate benefits of some of the work they may be doing to move towards cleaner sources of fuel as you all are doing. So I thought, let me, let me test drive this new tool with one of my favorite buildings, your building in Hadley. So these slides basically go through, you know, I'm introducing uh, to others about you in these first two slides and the, the study that you've been doing to figure out how to um, advance your building facilities. Um, this is a little bit about the other side of the coin here, their tool. Um, so it's this public use tool and it, uh, it has behind it, you know, the deep methodology that these experts have developed to understand the healthcare costs and the climate costs of operating our buildings in different ways. And so it now allows you to kind of run these different scenarios. And so that's what I did for your building, given the publicly available data that we had from that great report that you all worked with your utility on. Um, it's a pretty simple, you know, set of statistics, uh, you know, kind of the, the profile of your energy use today, um, burning, you know, number two fuel oil, burning some, some gas, using some electricity, and what it will look like afterwards. So we can kind of compare these two states of the world. 
Any any questions before I keep going here on kind of what I'm doing here, looking before and after? Sarah, no, I'm you, excited. Please continue, Sarah, Paul. Sarah, you pulled those data from data Chris had given you. These are data that were in the um, this report that MassSave. Oh right, gotcha. Did okay. your scoping study gave me all the data I needed to just plug it right into their pretty simple tool, which is online. Gotcha. And so it gives us a nice picture of kind of the before and after. Um, and these, this is kind of the summary picture, you know, and, and whether after 2025 or 2026, you know, there's a little number in there of the year, but the, the idea is that the before state and the after state is really the point. So you're looking at your energy footprint before and after, using a lot more energy, becoming more efficient. Um, that's that first row. Uh, the second row here, the emissions footprint, you know, um, emitting 338 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions before, and then you'll see, you know, drastically reducing that. Um, the air pollutants, you can't see a number, but it's just because the units are so small. There is a nice change there that you'll see in the graphics. And then um, the climate impact. So um, I should have introduced before, Brian Souza is with this collaborative team that built this tool. And so he helped me understand what these numbers represent, the kind of climate impact and health impacts. So I'll do my best and then Brian can, can correct me. But basically it's looking at the annual impact. It takes those um, greenhouse gas emissions of the today world or the tomorrow world and translates that into how we know putting additional greenhouse gas into the atmosphere is creating impacts in terms of dollars climate impacts on our on our communities, whether that's extreme weather, um, you know, damage to property, you know, those kind of things. And then on the health impact side, it's it's doing a similar thing where it's taking the air pollutants that we're putting into the atmosphere from our buildings and translating that into healthcare costs, since air pollution we know drives up healthcare costs. So this is not about, you know, healthcare costs for the students in the building. It's really, you know, your building, like most of our buildings, are contributing to air pollutants and to greenhouse you know, gas emissions. How do we take our individual contributions and kind of turn those into costs? And so these are annual numbers, and you're seeing how they, you know, dramatically fall uh, when we make these improvements to your building. So that's pretty cool. Any questions there before I hop on? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I, if you if you wouldn't mind, uh, you or Brian, maybe others know, but if I were asked, I'd want to be able to answer this question. So in that calculation, can can you offer a concrete example of a climate impact, like in how a dollar amount is assigned to it and then the reduction? Uh, and similarly with health impact. So an example of what that might represent yeah. and that people could wrap their head around and then how... Not, not all the formula, but how do you arrive at a dollar amount and the change? I'm so glad I have Brian here. <laughs> Brian, can I turn that over to you? Yeah, for sure. Um, how, can everyone hear me okay? Just want to make sure. Yes, yes. welcome. Um, um, hello, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Brian Sousa. I work over at uh, Boston University. Um, so to answer your question about, to start with the climate impacts. Um, so essentially, have you all heard of like the social cost of carbon before? Um, so that's basically the metric. Yeah, let's that not we're, assume that the listening audience. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so basically what we're using is this value called the social cost of carbon. And essentially what that value does is it looks at the, um, the impacts that are associated with climate change. So, um, sea level rise, uh, impacts on, uh, agriculture, uh, heat waves, um, and things like that. And the, um, basically the impacts that those will have on our society and and associate or and therefore like the economy um and puts that into a dollar value so what you're able to do is for every um ton of say like carbon dioxide that you emit into the atmosphere that is associated with a increased risk of um of worse climate change impacts and then based on those economic damages from climate change you're able to associate a dollar value per that ton. Um, is that is that clear? Yeah, I think so. I'm just going to say it back to you really quickly. And again, a lot of people watch school committee and we're grateful for that. And this project's really important. I know people in town want to understand it. 
Um, so I'm from Southern California. And when you said like rising sea level, that's a great example, right? So more carbon, this happens, sea level goes up at, or wildfires, nobody can get home insurance anymore. So that's like the mm -hmm. cost of rebuild, the cost of increased insurance costs, things like that could be potentially some of those costs that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, depending on the... Um the number that you, based on the model that you're using and the number that you're using, there are certain impacts that are included or not included in that uh, that simulation. But basically, yes. One thing I would note is that when you are looking at a the dollar impact that, say, the emissions from the school would have, it's not saying the those impacts are happening locally. That's a global estimate. So it's, in, it's encapsulating the uh, total impacts happening globally around the world and incorporating that into that dollar value. So you're not able to attribute it to one um, one specific outcome or, or one specific location. Um, but um, I think this is a good segue in, into talking about the health impacts because those are local. Um, and so with the, the health impacts, essentially what you're looking at is different types of air pollutants um, that are associated with those same emissions that your greenhouse gases are coming from. Um, and it's looking, we run a model that basically simulates what, how the distribution of that, that air pollution um, moves around uh, from where it's uh, located from or where it's coming from. And essentially, based on the populations that are around that source of uh, pollution, it estimates the uh, increased uh, risk of mortality from that air pollution. And then, so looking at that increased risk of mortality, uh, we use a economic value called the value of statistical life. Um, and that is basically just a uh, economic value that is, is basically looking at um, how much you are willing to pay to have a reduction in the uh, your risk of of dying, basically. Um, and so that's it's not it's not incorporating, um, say, this air pollution is causing more cases of asthma, which is therefore causing more burden on the healthcare system in your community. But it is saying that this air pollution is causing more cases of asthma that could potentially increase mortality rates around that community. Um, and if people wanted to understand or learn more about um, what you have, maybe it's later in the slides, is there a way for them to access additional information on this if people are listening and they want to follow up? For sure, for sure. Yeah, um, I think we can link you to the website uh, that should have an FAQ that answers a bunch of these questions. Um, if anybody really wants to dive deep into the, the research, we recently published a paper that came out earlier or late last year um, that kind of really goes into the nitty gritty of where we're pulling all the data from. Um, but yeah, so we can we can provide all that. Great. Thank you for explaining that. And I just want to uh, say, although the um, the Climate impact is something that is aggregate um, globally. Uh, you mentioned agriculture as a, an indicator of, and, and I know that Hadley agriculture has seen a lot of impact from flooding and blight, a lot of crops being uh, impacted as a result. Um, and uh, so it is the kind of uh, impact that, that hasn't been seen in years past. It feels very very mm -hmm. real and tangible. So uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And please continue with the presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, the next set of slides, you know, basically again, show you the before and after uh, tying them back to the different fuel use. So you're seeing your number two fuel oil is really driving a lot of your energy usage. It's also driving the lion's share of your um, greenhouse gas emissions and the lion's, a lot of your uh, air pollution also. Um, you're seeing these climate costs come down dramatically. This is just a the graphical version of that. The last slide I just wanted to show you because it was something we, we talked about early on was one of the nice things this tool does is it benchmarks the uh, carbon, the green, greenhouse gas emissions coming from your building against the policy that's now in force in Boston uh, that sets limits on um, how much emissions buildings can produce before they incur a fine. And that threshold that Boston is subject to, you know, gets more intense through time. So that's the, the bars that you're seeing in gray that go down through time. So there's a certain standard for the 2025-29 period, 
it gets more stringent, it gets more stringent, it gets more stringent. And were that Boston policy to be extended statewide, as legislators are talking about doing right now, let's just say they took the same policy as Boston has, right now your building would be pretty significantly over that threshold that's you know going to hit Boston properties in 2025. <clears throat> when you do this retrofit, <clears throat> As you'll see, you're you're moving yourself. <laughs> Excuse me, into a position where you're um, even, uh, you know, on par with the 2020 2040 kind of threshold. So, um, versus not doing that investment, it would leave you kind of at risk from future policy perspective. Sorry, I usually have water handy for just this moment, and of course, just this moment, I didn't. Um, this is the last slide. So any questions on this? Does this policy benchmarking make sense? So good future-proofing decision that you're making to make this switch because as Massachusetts continues to get serious about um, meeting its climate targets, buildings are a big part of getting where they need to get serious. And so I certainly expect this Boston policy to in some form get ex uh, expanded statewide and you guys are setting yourselves up to be in compliance with that. Sarah, I want to make sure that I'm reading this slide the right way. And what I'm seeing on the left is uh, a, the red bar indicating what is permissible in, in the year 2022 uh, for a Boston-based building, whereas on the right in 2025, that will become the new standard. Um, is that, am I reading it the right way? I'm so glad you asked because no. On okay. the left, that red bar is your building. Our That's building. Your building today. I see. And your level of emissions compared to the new threshold that is about to start to hit in Boston for 2025. You currently are over the threshold, that first threshold that's going to hit Boston 2025 and pretty significantly over. Right. And the Boston threshold is the dark gray? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So there's a uh, five Boston thresholds because they get more serious through time. So the years that you're seeing at the bottom say, all right, we're going to start you off in 2025, and we're going to hold you to a certain standard, right? Just under 0.004. And we're going to give you some more time, but we're going to, we're going to tighten the belt. We're going to tighten the belt. We're going to tighten the belt, right? We're going to make these standards even more stringent. So um, yeah, the red bar is you in both cases. It's you before you make this change way out of compliance with the Boston standard. The red on the on the right-hand graph is you after you make this investment in ground source heat pumps. Ah, now you are wildly in compliance, not just for this first threshold, but the thresholds to come for several decades. It only becomes by 2040 that you'd even need to do any more work, right? Excellent. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. I'm so glad you asked. I'm sorry I was not clear the first time around. Not at all. Christine. I'm I'm just curious. Um, I don't know if you can answer this, but so if Boston is creating these benchmarks, what are they doing to for um, financial incentives to help schools get there? Well, yeah, I mean, this the difference. And so this is all under Mayor Wu. She's committed a large budget to the Green New Deal for Boston public schools. Um, and it's, yeah, a huge financial commitment that she has made um, to support, you know, not only- Are they providing the help for this? Um, they they are providing, I mean, this is all in kind of city budget negotiation, so I'm not an expert on it, but but yeah, this is um, this is part of her commitment to help the, uh, it looks like Brian wants to jump in and, and help me right. out here. Oh, uh, I just wanted to add, um, in addition to what Sarah had mentioned, um, there's also things that the state can do in terms of um, making the electrical grid greener, um, which will indirectly help your building. So as um, like Sarah had shown before, mostly the emissions were looking were coming from like the direct use of fuel oil in your building. But as you switch to eventually electrifying, and then as the grid itself becomes cleaner by running off renewables, then your associated emissions will also drop. Um, and that's something that's included right now in the in the tool. Um, when you're able to look at future scenarios, it actually incorporates uh, projected um, changes to the grid um, and how that's expected to look. 
Um, and we're looking at incorporating like other hypothetical future scenarios as well. Is there a st any other state incentives other than, I mean, I know we're looking at um, the Green New Deal and infrastructure, but does the state itself have any other financial grants available or I'm just trying to figure, you know, see if there are any other avenues in which to um, help with the yeah. retro. That's all. It, it's a great question. So um, I believe as your superintendent and some other members know that uh, Massachusetts School Building Authority is has committed to bring to the marketplace a new program as of January 2025, which is a heat pump retrofit program. So they understand that districts need more financial support to do this. And so, um, you know, they're currently in the process of selecting a consultant to help them design that program uh, to help, you know, really kind of shape it in a way that'll give districts the support they need, you know, how best to to uh, disseminate the resources, you know, all those nitty gritty kind of programmatic questions. So I think we should expect to see some more support specifically for heat pump retrofits from the MSBA. That seems pretty clear. And this is an active, um, you know, a big part of the state's policy conversation is how do we fund this very expensive work? And so things like the clean heat standard is another policy that they are talking about um, potentially implementing, which would generate revenue to help pay for some of this work. So it's a it's a topic of ongoing conversation, how we fund this massive transformation that's needed in our buildings. Uh, never mind other infrastructure to do this work, but it's a, it's a great question, Christine. And if I could just, um, for the viewing public who may not have heard any of our conversations in previous months about our investigation into uh, use of uh, geothermal um, and other uh, potential cleaner alternatives. Um, we, um, we had already approved in our capital plan uh, replacing boilers in year two or three at the tune of about 1.8 million. And what we learned through Sarah and Undaunted K-12 was that, uh, and also through um, Mass Save and Eversource was that uh, between the Inflation Reduction Act and Eversource incentives, we happen to uh, qualify for, um, uh, we, we may be able to get geothermal not at the 3.6 million that it would cost, but rather 900,000. Um, so substantially reducing our economic impact to begin with. And uh, what we're hearing now is that the Massachusetts School Board Association, uh, MSBA, I think, uh, that gives new money for schools, uh, has also announced a new program for funding for schools to go down this path, which would potentially bring our impact even lower than 900,000. Do I capture that correctly, Sarah? Yeah, I have no idea what the qualification criteria will be. Um, those that have been in the school's land for a while understand that, you know, the the list of um, people who want money from the MS Bay is long and the people who get it is short. So right. um, I don't know to what degree the district could count on those funds, right? I right. think that's, that's an open question. So I wouldn't want to set expectations that that is a definite. I think that the IRA money is, is there for you all and does not require you to compete. The mass save incentives that you discuss is there for you all and does not require you to compete. I think the MSBA money will, you know, be harder to come by, and so it would be icing on the cake. Indeed, and all, and and the bottom line is the uh, the economic value proposition is already there. That nine hundred thousand versus one point eight million for a traditional boiler system is is already a, a no brainer proposition with the incentives, and it only gets better potentially. Great, thank you. Great. Hey Sarah, right. I, have three, I have three questions. Um, Great. just to clarify, the the Boston standard that is just a city government standard. It's not a state standard that applies to just that state city. Okay. Um, on your slides, you had a caveat up in the top that wasn't in what the packet that she sent us. Do oh. you include, do, does that include the on-site solar? We talked about that, the note. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, it, 
it does not include the fact that you guys will be using on-site solar. So that, okay. you know, as Brian was mentioning before, one of the aspects of this tool is, you know, they're looking at the electricity grid of today and it's not perfectly clean right now. We know, right? Even our electricity grid has emissions associated with it. Right. And they can look at that through time. Well, you guys, by installing solar, you're saying, well, we're not even going to use some of that power from the electricity grid. We're going to make some of our own. And that's 100% clean. Right. right. That is not integrated into this. So the story right. is even better than the one you are seeing here. This story assumes that you're getting 100% of these elect electrons, you know, from from that grid uh, in its in its current dirty clean in transition form. That's it. OK, thanks. And the third question maybe is for Annie and Chris, if he's on. Um, what is the status of that exploration into the geothermal and, and such? Uh, Chris, you would, or I can say, I believe that you guys selected uh, an engineering and design firm. Is Chris on the call? He is on the call. Yes. Yeah, I'm right here. Okay. <laughs> we select, you guys selected the firm. And uh, Chris, do you want to pick up where they're at with the work at this point? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So, so I put together the contract. We both signed it. It's all sent out. They are coming tomorrow morning for their first walkthrough of the building. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Annie. Okay. And thanks, Sarah and Brian. Really appreciate that readout. It's really helpful information. Great pleasure. Hopes to give you more context and additional yeah. motivation as you go down this path. It's definitely some way to quantify the benefits. I appreciate it. Any other questions for Sarah and Brian? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you too. All right, we're going to move forward with the uh, remainder of our agenda, if I can just pan over to it. Okay, we are uh, on item B, Hopkins Academy Fields Update. And for that, we have Chris here. Okay, yes, here I am back again. Uh, so the fields are moving along. Um, unfortunately, the weather really has not been our friend, it seems since we started this. So, um, you know, rain has just caused a lot of floods on the field and what that did was really put us behind schedule. Um, really unavoidably, but nevertheless, we're not, um, you know, at the point we would be. Um, at this point in time, the sod is being laid down, um, but you do have an item in your meeting package. Um, we've received a letter, oh, about 10 days ago from Berkshire Design just alerting us of the risk involved with playing on the sod before um, the suggested time frame um, has elapsed between installation when we actually use the fields. And that was that, it, uh, in their opinion, it would void the warranty on the fields. So, you know, if there was damage to the sod or sec sections of it did not root and survive, uh, you know, the transplant between where it was and the fields, um, that the contractor would not be on the hook for the replacement of the sod, the district would be. Um, and so they just, you know, really wanted to make sure we were aware of that. Um, when I received that email, I did forward it on to Ann with um, a comment that I, I thought maybe the school committee should be aware of this as well. Uh, it's certainly not something, you know, when you receive information like that, you really don't want to just read it and then put it away and, and not alert anyone of the you know potential risks involved. So um, there's a copy of it in your meeting package. Um, I have been in contact with uh, both Berkshire Design and the contractor to try to get this um, straightened out and you know settled so that we all know exactly where we stand on it. Um, I sent an email to them on Friday just asking to the contractor, asking where um, where we stood with the warranty, you know, um, the specs called for seeding. Originally, we were going to seed the fields. Then as the weather didn't cooperate last year, we switched it over to sod in a good portion of the areas, um, hoping that, okay, the sod's planted. It's, you know, relatively instant grass. We'll be able to play on it. Um, then, you know, the rain continued in the spring, which delayed um, the installation of the sod again. Um, and so, you know, where exactly does this put us with the warranty? Um, I didn't get a response on Friday, so I reached out again this morning just to give a heads up and say, hey, you know, did you get the email? I, I 
you know, like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, and, and they responded that uh, we would be able, you know, they talked about it over the weekend and we'd be able to discuss it at our Wednesday meeting. We have meetings every Wednesday morning about the fields. Uh, and I responded that, you know, the school committee is discussing this tonight. It would certainly be helpful if we had this information today rather than Wednesday and um, offered to meet with them this afternoon if they had time. Um, I did get a call from Greg Omasta um, saying that they uh, first, you know, the, the general opinion was that baseball and softball were much easier on um, the turf than, say, soccer or football, um, you know, in terms of the, the running and stopping hard and, you know, um, you know, certainly with football tackling really chews up the grass, you know, so, um, but, you know, there was no mention of the warranty, so I asked him, I said, you know, here's my dilemma. We have these fields. We have a substantial amount of money tied up in the grass. We want to be sure that if something happens, uh, you know, we're still covered. Um, Greg did respond that they would honor the warranty um, for the sod. Um, and so I, uh, you know, that, that was on the phone. Fred and I were at the fields this afternoon when Greg called, and it was a verbal um, assurance that they would cover us and, and make the necessary repairs. Um, I did, when I got back to the office, email them and say, you know, I'd really love to have this something written down where we could all sign it and, and just have it agreed upon. Um, and well, that was, you know, later in the day. Uh, and so I haven't gotten a response on that yet. So unfortunately, there's no assurance that they, you know, that they want to put it in writing. Um, but he's been pretty good, really, to us about, um, you know, covering us when when we have any kinds of concerns or anything, you know, we've had a, a few items where we're like, geez, we don't really like that. We, we'd prefer it something else. Um, and he has gone out of his way to accommodate our requests, often at no charge to us, which is certainly appreciated. Um, and so I, I'm assuming at the Wednesday meeting, although, you know, there's no guarantee on this, that we'd be able to put something together. But that's where we're at right now is the request to have uh, you know some kind of document saying okay we had sod instead of seed there's not going to be a 60 day um rest period to allow it to root like we would have with seed you know obviously a, an entirely different process than than laying down sod um and the warranty would still remain even if we use the fields after this shortened resting period um so i i unfortunately i can't you know, definitively say that they will put something in writing. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they did, but that's where we're at right now. May I just add, so I think what we are trying to get to from here, uh, Chris and I both want to thank Omasta. As Chris pointed out, they're an excellent company, a local company. They've done a lot of work for the schools in the town, and we're extremely appreciative of how they always try to go above and beyond to work with us. The idea of having something clearly written out is so everybody is clear on what is being promised or not promised. And then we'd ask uh, the Dupre, Kim Dupre, to take a look at it, the school committee's attorney, just again, this is to make sure that everybody's understanding what's being agreed to. Um, and then if it were possible um, to um, begin using the fields earlier than we anticipate based on the letter we got originally from Berkshire Design, um, we would move forward with that um, if we were certain that there was no financial risk to the school department, which is essentially by the town. Um, and so that's what we would be looking for. But right now, as of today in this moment, they're not ready and we're trying to work toward uh, a resolution. We just don't have that right now. Thank you, Annie and Chris. Um, Appreciate you explaining this. I think it makes a lot of sense to have something in writing, and I'm optimistic that we will be able to get there. Uh, if we if we don't, what are what is what is the potential implication for um, plans that we had for those fields this spring? So Fred has um, moved originally scheduled, I should say, all of our home games in May and early June, rather than spread out throughout the season, really just to allow for, um, you know, the fields to actually get the grass to, uh, to root. Um, what it would mean is, and I know that Fred's been looking for alternate fields to play on, um, you know, if we could use 
any other fields um, in another town. I know he looked at UMass trying to rent the field from them for our games as well. Uh, he's met with very little success. So if we're unable to use the fields, then we would have to have it where every game uh, the season would be played away. Even if, even if Hadley was the home team in the game, as far as, you know, the batting order, um, they would still be played at the opposing team's field. Um, so, you know, of course there are, there are costs involved with that for us. I mean, obviously we would have transportation costs that we normally wouldn't ex expect to have. Um, but that, that would really be where we're at at this point in time. The other question I have for you, Chris, is what is the financial exposure of having to replace the sod? And is it just the sod that is potentially at risk uh, by using it before that 60 day period? Or are there other aspects to the design that are also potentially null, according to Berkshire Designs uh, letter? So when we did the sod, we went out, um, I believe it's 330 feet in the outfield, uh, left and right fields, 350 feet to center field, which, you know, that's, the, you know, we're talking Fenway Park size or actually even a little longer than Fenway Park in some spots. Um, so, you know, the assumption is that no balls are going to be hit further than that. That's where the sod ends and the seeding starts. So again, the assumption was that, well, there's not going to be um, outside of the occasional stray ball that might roll there or something, there's not going to be a lot of foot traffic in, you know, the seeded areas. So we, you know, we wouldn't have to worry about that. Um, as far as, you know, we, we also asked Berkshire for, you know, an opinion on, well, if we say put sod in the baseball field and use that and also put sod as we replace the infield of the JV field from phase one, what if we didn't use the JV field, but we used uh, the varsity field only, um, that was a little tougher question to get an answer for. Um, you know, they asked around their office and they really couldn't give us an answer other than, you know, it's kind of hard to prove where kids were and where kids weren't, you know, so um, it, it, it would pretty much, you know, it, it's a tough call as far as that goes. Um, but, you know, that, that was the plan when we switched to the sod in these general areas is that we're going to make it big enough where, it would be the size of a regular baseball or softball field. Um, as far as the financial exposure, I mean, the total cost of the sod is around because we've we've added and subtracted in areas, but I would say it's around one hundred eighty thousand dollars. Thank you, Chris. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, I uh, I know Joyce's hand was up first, but Joyce, if you could hang tight, um, I'd love to get our school committee perspectives out here first. Christine? I, I guess my question is, so weather permitting and base, you know, best case scenario is the sod goes down and we play on it. What happens if we run into weather like we had last year? What is that going to do to the fields? You mean in terms of if it's swampy like <laughs> like it was last year? Uh, there's a number of things. First of all, the drainage in the fields, um, especially in the areas where it was swampy, was actually doubled from what we had last year. So we had drain lines every 20 feet. Now we have drain lines every 10 feet. Um, we also did significant work, which apparently was the cause of part of this problem, um, to the uh, drainage culvert that runs along the side of the field all the way down to Bay Road, I believe. Um, and a lot of work was done to that. And it was great when we walked out to see it after they basically dredged uh, that trench to see that the water was running away from the field. Uh, prior to that work, the water level, it was kind of stuck because there were so many higher areas of silt and weeds that had grown there that it was acting kind of as a dam. And so the water was actually flowing back into the fields um, rather than flowing away from it. So all of that is, is obviously being addressed. Um, but if it came down to say using the varsity field, which is at the far corner of the field and has much better drainage than you know the, the corner where the JV field is, um, that would be an incident where we'd have to take it on a game by game basis. And you know, if Fred walked out, I mean, <laughs> Fred doesn't want these uh, fields to get chewed up, you know, any more than any of us do. So that would be a situation where he would have to check the field, 
see the conditions and call it accordingly if it was needed to be. So even, you know, I'm just looking at in terms of whether or not, you know, um, we should maybe revisit this after, you know, in our, at our May meeting and then, you know, that and talk about possibly using the fields for tournament, um, but not have them, you know, giving it the best shot at success by putting it off for a little bit. I just, I'm if just, I could just chime in. I think yeah. that just, just knowing and talking to Fred about all he's done to rearrange it really puts the season in jeopardy. Okay. It's that significant. And with nine seniors on the team, I think we really need to take a good look, hard look about whether we can make this work. And if you have Omasta saying sod is very different than seed, baseball is very different than soccer and football, um, you know, what's our level of risk? Is the level of risk exposure really 180,000? Or might we have a couple spots that get damaged such you need to repair and it's more like a couple thousand? Uh, and is that worth it compared to uh, potentially? Is that, our, is that our 180 or is that their 180? Well, I, I, what, the, what I'm I asking. Think I think it's, well, Chris outlined it pretty clearly, right? Yeah. So we've got a verbal agreement. Obviously, we're, we're looking to get the written agreement. Um, if we have a written agreement, then I, I don't think there's much of a conversation. If we don't, I think we just need to reassess then and mm -hmm. say, what truly is the risk? Is it 180 or is it there spots that might get damaged due to a couple of games getting played? Is repairing spots 180,000? I mean, if there's a widespread loss of the entire sod, which I think would be highly unlikely, uh, um, then you'd want the whole 180 re refunded. But if there's spots damaged due to baseball games, then maybe we take it on our own to have that risk to repair so that we can have a season. Um, I think there's really significant um, concerns here that we need to have, be able to play some games at home. And I think Fred's done everything he can to push that off as long as he can. Uh, but I think risk, you know, defining that risk is is helpful. But if, if Omasta says, no, they're going to put in writing what they've thankfully committed to verbally, then frankly, I don't see there's a risk. They've negated that. Thank you, Christine. Ethan. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I like both sides. Um, I'm, there's probably not a bigger sports guy out there than me. And I'm, I, I think Paul, I'd push back a little bit. I'm not too worried. I mean, I get that these kids might not have a home game, but they're still going to have a full season. They're still going to have the opportunity to play in the tournament. And I, I can't help but think about how this project has kind of gone and how challenging it's been at times. Um, and how we're, staring down the barrel of asking the town for a lot of money in the next five to 10 years. And I just want to be conscious of the fact that um, for a couple of home games that could potentially impact the field. And again, I say all this knowing that weather could impact or not impact this, right? We could have a beautiful spring and the fields could be great and we could get the kids out there. And I think that would be awesome. Um, but I, I just worry that we're like saying like, Oh, we need a couple of baseball games on our home field. So let's, let's take that risk. And you're right, Paul, I don't know what the risk is. It's probably not huge, but I also know that, you know, we're just putting sod down on the baseball fields and not the rest of the field. We're going to seed it. Like there's part of me that says, let's just seed it and do it right this time instead of rushing this project forward. Like it feels like we're doing a little bit. Um, and I don't think that, I don't know that that's necessarily the answer, but I just, I keep, thinking like, are we doing this for a couple of baseball games that the kids are going to get to play anyways? And again, like I said, like, there's nobody bigger that wants to see these kids play sports than me. I just, I don't want to mess these fields up. I want to do it right. And Paula, you know, as much as I do, how hard it was on the kids when they missed their basketball season because of COVID. So I have every sympathy and every, you know, I completely understand how the parents and the seniors want to play on the fields as much as I did as you know um so that's but is is it fiscally responsible in terms of you know taking a risk if there's no risk that's one thing but I just can't you know justify us having to pay for something when we're not you know when we've been told 
we really shouldn't be doing it. And I always live by, you know, Murphy's law, if it can go wrong, it will. <laughs> so uh, I, I just worry that we could, you know, turn around. I don't want to have to say, sorry, but probably wasn't our best decision at any time. That's all. You know, I mean, if they could, I mean, by tournament, that would be awesome. At least if we could have something to offer, I just don't know if it's worth the risk now. So just, just to be clear, the sod will be done tomorrow. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a moot point, Ethan. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's right, kind no, of- I know that. I know, I know. Oh, okay. So I wasn't sure you knew that. Sod's, sod's already in. It'll be finished tomorrow. Um, I'm a little confused. If Omasta, who's laying the sod and is holding the warranty, writes in, in that they're not concerned that we start playing May 10th, are, are, you, are you still concerned about risk? Because that guarantee would, just, would say if you use it prior to that, they will repair it. I I I I get that part. I just okay. I'm thinking about the fact that we're going to ask the town for a lot of money over the next five to ten years, and if we're just willing to, like, bank on, like, oh, if this warranty works out and the weather works out, then we're fine. I I I just don't know what it looks like to the to the public for a couple of baseball games. This is kind of where I land. Well, so I, I think we should talk to the athletic director. I think the language was the season might not continue unless we can play at home. So I don't want to minimize the couple home games, that language. I think it might be more significant than that. We should talk to the athletic director. I, I'm still at a loss. If the company who's installing the, the product says the warranty holds, even if no. we play May 10th, I see no risk to us. So, Except that the fields are going to have to get repaired again, right? And it'll and be it'll those, be repaired at their cost. And it'll be repaired. And I can't at, imagine. No, I, 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 like I'm, I'm, I'm fine with the cost. I just I I feel yes. like this project has taken a long time. We've made adjustments throughout it, um, and this just feels like why can't we just wait the two months like we're supposed to? I, so that to me is a low. I mean, from my understanding. It really does jeopardize the season. And for nine seniors for an important sport where there's no financial cost, there might be, we might have to lay, they might have to lay a couple more rolls aside. It could, you know, maybe we have to wait a little extra here or there. I really think that benefit is is worth that risk. Yeah, I just, I didn't you know? get the sense that it was going to jeopardize the season. I I heard that they were going to have to play all away games, which wouldn't be great, but they still get a season. Um, I'm not sure that's true. I'm not sure that okay. last part that they still get a season straight. I think we should ask for it. Uh, well, I think that's part of the problem is we we don't know what Omasta is going to put in their letter, and we don't know. I think that I think that's part of the problem is we're just not we don't have all the answers yet. Well, if they confirm so, what they wrote, what they said verbally in writing, hopefully, Chris, you can get that. Then I'm fine. I mean, I think that really just takes away all risk and the benefit of the the kids being able to have a season pretty important to those families and those kids i really think honestly too if we said no we're not willing to take that risk i think you'd have nine families in your office saying come on that's a really low risk can't you just can't we just accept that risk uh when the company's already saying that they'll warranty it if you start playing and they'll repair it with no cost it's pretty yeah, good paul I, I tend to agree with you that if omasta can put this in writing and it uh it essentially obviates what Berkshire Design is saying that there right. that there, that it would be warranted. Then it there is a case that we may it, it's a manageable level of risk, and I I, I truly understand uh, the perspectives of all. This has been a project that has taken so long, and we are almost at the finish line. It's had its bumps, uh, irrigation wise, and. With all this rain, this rain is not going away. This is a new normal in terms of uh, climate impact. So uh, we're almost there. It sounds like there may be a viable solution. Let's um, make sure that, that what we mean about the level of risk for the baseball season. And Chris, uh, Desjardins, and Annie, if you could close the loop in terms of that letter in writing and also finding out what that impact is to the baseball team. Um, let's revisit this in May. Hopefully we won't have to revisit it. If there's a letter and the uh, school attorney is like, yep, you're, you're clear, then we shouldn't have to, but, uh, but worst case, we'll revisit in May. And I, 
Is oh, Fred, yes. is Fred good to go at least for the beginning of the season? If, if well, that's, the question. Wait. That, that's the question, right? So if the first home game is May 10th, we need okay. to decide before that. We should decide next week after we hear from Amasta. But I, think I also think have... we need to get that that part of it correct because I I mean there are the there is the ability to move games and I know Fred has been working diligently to do that. Um, I think I just don't, I, don't, I, think, I don't think we we rush I, this. I don't think we should assume we know what Fred's dealing with. If we have questions about that, I think you laid it out well, Fumara. Let's see what Amasta says. See what our attorney says. To me, if Amasta comes back and writes something that our attorney says is, uh, food, you know, obviates the risk, I'm good. I don't need to hear from Fred. If you all need to, but we, I would encourage us to do that prior to May 10th, since we have a home game planned at the start of the season. We can't wait till our next uh, school committee meeting to decide this. Okay, so in, in, in closing about this, I would say, Annie, if you could wrap your mind around all of this and, and get that information. If we need to have uh, an emergency school board meeting as we have in the past, uh, then please call us for availability early in May to bring uh, a quorum of us together to make any decisions that need to be made. Hopefully it won't come to that. Right. Hopefully so this, this is, is very straightforward. Yeah. This is what I hear as my takeaways. Uh, as we said, and I want to underscore how helpful Amasa has been, what we want to do is to make sure that this is clearly stated in writing, that the school committee attorney has gone over it, so that we're not hearing something Omasta is not saying. Just want everybody to be clear. They're a great business partner. We want to be fair to them. We want to be fair to us. If at the end of that, it is clear that no, the, the warranty essentially, that the warranty remains intact, then there would be no reason not to move forward. The warranty remains intact. It's almost like the Berkshire letter never arrived, right? Um, I just, I'm seeing head nods, so you're okay with that. The attorney says, this agreement is the same. Your warranty is intact, regardless of what you do. Um, then we would be in a position to move forward. And we would still update the school committee in May, but I wouldn't need to convene the school committee prior to that. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Sounds right to me, yes. Thank you. Right. Can I just Any, add something? Yes, please. To that, I, I just want to um, underscore the fact that, you know, asking for this to be spelled out in writing by no means constitutes a lack of trust on our part with oh, Omasta at all. at all. They've been very honorable with this whole process. It, it's really just, you know, it's prudent business practice, really, to just make sure on both sides, quite honestly, just to oh, make so sure everyone is on the same yeah. page. Right. So, thank you. Thank yeah, you I just for to be clear with that. that. Absolutely. Any other um, discussion from school committee members on this topic? All right. And Joyce, thank you so much for waiting until the school committee deliberated. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Uh, would love to hear your perspective on this. I know you're a, an OG as it relates to this project. Um, I think it was the land was purchased under your school committee tenure. It was and a long coming. So, of course, I'm anxious to see that the kids are actually able to use the fields. Also, um, offering that Sue Glukowski is our risk management person for the town. Um, so if there was any doubt uh, that Chris could contact her um, uh, if you if he had to for any type of things. But I've always learned over the years, you cross your T's and dot your I's. Um, no matter if somebody says verbally what they're going to do, you always need it in writing, especially since you have received a letter from your, your design team that has suggested that you don't use the fields as soon as you would like to, because I know Mass is very reputable. I've, I've known him throughout the years. I have no problem with him, but a deal is a deal and a project is a project. So you always wanna make sure that your design team is also in alignment with the people that are doing the project. So um, that was just what I was I had to offer. And if Chris needed to contact Sue for any other type of thing that he needed because of the contracts or anything like that, he most certainly can. So um, just leaving it at that and hoping uh, it can be used. If it can't, then, you know, that's that's going to be up to 
you all what, what you decide, so. Thank you, Joyce, and great suggestion about Sue. Chris, you have all the information needed to be able to pursue that if needed? Yes. Excellent, terrific. Yeah. All right, thank you, Joyce. Okay, thank you. All right, um, we don't have to vote on anything about this, we can move on. And so thank you everyone for contributing to the discussion. I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to um, positive resolution on this. Okay, we are going to move to item C, donor recognition for the Hopkins Academy Field and the Hadley Elementary School Playground. Annie and Chris. Yeah, I can summarize some of the discussion we had in policy subcommittee. Of course, Ethan and Chris correct anything that uh, isn't on point. So we look closely at the current policy, which is linked into your agenda for the school committee. You folks also looked at that last month. And we're clear that the current policy really talks about naming facilities and the conversation we've been having is more around donor recognition. Uh, the committee did, the subcommittee didn't feel as though we necessarily needed a separate and distinct policy around donor recognition. It would be difficult to come up with a policy that captured every single scenario. Procedures, which it seems like we're already following these protocols that made sense um, and that align with our naming policy would be that should a group, usually we have a group like for the AGS playground and we have a liaison for that, for the fields, we have a school committee liaison, so Chris and Paul respectively, that when folks are working um, with groups that are fundraising, uh, if they come up with a suggestion, if that group comes up with a suggestion about how to recognize donors, in this case, I'm not talking about things like recognizing them in, in newsletters and sending thank you letters, but actual physical recognition. So a plaque affixed to a space or some type of um, uh, physical object that recognized people, that that would be brought to the entire school committee, a description of said recognition, um, what it is, dimensions, uh, visuals, if we have those, where that object would go, um, how it would be maintained, who's responsible for that, and who would be recognized, you know, what level of donor would be recognized. This is essentially kind of what Tara brought in those levels of donor recognition. We did this quite a while ago with the fields as well. So we thought that those procedures and protocols seem to be working well. In terms of the Hopkins Academy fields, um, again, right now it's kind of touch and go of when that first game is. I would like to say, generally speaking, that um, before there is a home game or on that day, we would certainly like to invite everybody who has contributed to bringing the fields, making that vision a reality. I invite Hadley Media to be there and verbally recognize everybody who's contributed, Board of Trustees, CPA, East Hampton Savings Bank, uh, countless individual donors on and on and on and families recognize those folks. I know that Fred had some ideas about a way, kind of a, a, a way to a physical object that would have folks' names on it. And we have more information on what that might look like. We would bring that to school committee, go through those things. Here's what it is. Here's where it would go. Here's who's taking care of it. Here's whose name is on it uh, and, and why. Um, and then uh, we would have a second, we would ask folks, donors, invite them back again on the fields. Donors could go to one, both, or none, and we would ask Hadley Media if they would kindly record that. So we're thinking for the field. So that's the general discussion the policy subcommittee had around donor recognition and also what we're thinking for the fields. And um, I know Tara might have some updates on the HES playground as well. just asked Annie to put it on here um, in regards to we started discussion last time about donor recognition and so I'm glad to see that the policy committee kind of looked at the current policy um, and I, I personally agree I don't know that it needs to be changed and then I guess from the perspective um, of the um, group that's working to fundraise for the playground um, I think that makes it pretty clear um, what we would need to do. We did come with that original donor recognition document, um, but since then, and, and that was approved, um, but since then, um, we have 
um, talked about considering adjusting that. So what I will plan on doing is um, we actually have a meeting on Wednesday. Our next meeting is on Wednesday. Um, talking with the group about a little bit more specifics and make sure that we can provide all that um, um, specifics in the request that Annie just named off and bring it back to school committee. Um, and, you know, I just, I, I do want to say that I know that, you know, something such as the fields is um, a much larger financial um, indebtment to people who have donated, but I've, you know, I've kind of started paying a little bit more attention to my surroundings. We've We've got a plaque on the wall in the cafeteria for the mural that was done. We've got the plaque for the climbing wall um, that was done um, in the elementary gymnasium. And, you know, various things done. And, and you know, um, I, I don't think it's bad of us to recognize because, again, it's the same, you know, a lot of the same people who are donating at the, at the Fields Project are here again donating for us at the elementary school and have in the past. Um, so I... You know, I don't think it's wrong of us to to find ways to be able to recognize them in any way, shape, or form, um, because we want to show our appreciation. and And I don't think it negates any um, recognition in the past either. Right? I, I think it just, you know, school committee could technically turn over. Um, you know, every three years we could have turnover, and opinions change. Um, and this is where we're at right now. And I I think it's good to say. We haven't done in the past consistently. Here's where we're at now. Here's what we'd like. Um, I just think in our small community, we have a lot of people who are really, um, really gracious to the schools. So I think it. I think it's. I think it's a small token to be able to appreciate them and whatever we get. So, long and short, um, I will plan on talking about that with the group and um, coming up with a little bit more specific. Um, deciding on kind of what this recognition would look like and try to provide you with um, as concrete of an example um, of what we would request for it to look like and bring it back for May. Um, I have an update for everything else, but I figured I you'd want me to wait down to school committee updates down there, so I'll, I'll update that later. Great. Thank you, Tara. Yes, um, we should keep the scope just to the donor recognition. And thank you for that update, uh, Annie, as well. Um, and just to something that you said, Tara, I don't think that um, there has ever been um, a debate as to whether or not we should recognize donors for these two projects. I think there's what I sensed in our last meeting was strong support and just a desire to truly think about what all our options are and be, be creative in, um, in how we do that. Um, so I'm really excited to see what you and the playground team come up with for proposals. I'm really excited to hear what the fields team proposes as well. Um, I could not agree with you more. Oftentimes it's the same families and the same businesses that are generously donating. Without them, we could not do all that we wish to do or want to do. And so we are so uh, blessed, feel a lot of gratitude. And I think that visual reminder to the community of, of that gratitude is also incredibly important. So uh, it's it, we wanna be really thoughtful and intentional about how, and I'm excited to do that with you all. Um, Chris, Pip. Oh, I just wanted to say that, you know, there's nothing to say that anybody who does feel like they may not have been recognized in the past for us not to rectify that as well. It's not, it's never been about, you know, not wanting to, it, it sometimes it just uh, didn't happen. So, you know, there, it, it's never been about that and it should never change what we do going forward. So. That's an excellent point. And if you're someone out there who knows of an instance where that acknowledgement didn't take place, um, please be in touch with any one of our school committee members or uh, Annie or Chris. Um, we'd love to um, make sure to rectify that. Great. Can I, okay. Can I just ask, sorry, sorry, jump in yes. there. So, and I totally agree with you, Tara. So, um, Annie and Tara, is, are we, I just want to make sure we walk away with clear next steps. So if we, um, 
I know Fred and you, Annie, had talked about ideas for the fields. Tara, you all are coming up with ideas. Is that, is that how we want to do it? It's, if I can help with any of those, I just want to know, you know what's, what's, what's happening next. Uh, I would say on the field side, like I said, if I, if it happens that there's a home game prior to our next school committee meeting, that one thing I want to make sure that we do is that we verbally recognize it's like a mini non-ribbon ribbon cutting, right? All those people before we walk out on that field to okay. say Thank you so much. And then in May, if we have that, I think Chris uh, D has also been talking with Fred about um, what I'd like to present is this is this is a an idea that about how you know what this what this object looks like that we've yeah. done our on and where it would be bring it to the school committee and again i'm showing you what it is where it's going to go who's taking care of it as i said when we recognize donors we don't want their names then to be covered with moss and bird dew so like who takes care of it and whose name is on it and why um yeah. and that helps the school committee identify any blind spots something we're not thinking of and then we can just move forward with that and again, in the case of the fields, we'd invite people back again if they wanted to come or they could watch it being recorded if Hadley Media could help us out with that. You think it's something similar, Tara, for the program? Hmm? So, yeah, so we had um, in that original donor recognition, I'm really sorry. I have um, so in the original donor recognition, we had planned on doing the ribbon cutting ceremony, the verbal recognition, um, a certificate um, of um, donor recognition that would be provided to the donor themselves. And there's kind of a tiered level out um, of who would get that um, in a thank you letter as well to every donor that's at every level. Um, and then... Um, we had, I think last time I had presented um, you know, the different options acts, um, just as the physical recognition um, and made suggestions on kind of at what level would we consider that donation. Um, what I will tell you is that I think when the project is finished, um, it's going to be a much smaller donation list um, that would be considered for the fields um, as far as the sheer number. So how we recognize might look different um, than how we recognize for the fields. Um, but I, I think that, it, I guess from my own opinion, each one of those can look unique to the project that's being done and doesn't necessarily represent, well, they got a plaque and I got this or whatever it may be. Um, I think they can be unique to the project. And I think that donors would be appreciative no matter how that, how that looks. So that, that's um, what we had touched upon on, in our meeting was that each project has to be addressed individually because there, there's always going to be, you know, unique changes. It's, it's not something that we can actually create a policy on more just of like a procedure of how to address it. Um, but each is individual. Right. And project large or small, I think that's what makes it hard to put kind of that monetary restriction on it too, because you might have a project that's so much smaller right. than it. If you have an overall guideline that says we're only going to recognize you at this amount, it doesn't add up for every, every, every project. So I think it, I, I agree, it has to be individualized and maybe project. So I'm hopeful this group that I'm working with is very creative. Um, so I think we can come up with something pretty unique and uh, related to the playground. Any other questions or um, items for discussion on this topic? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Keep us posted and um, look forward to um, moving forward on the donor recognition for both the fields and the playground. Okay, moving on to item E. We are uh, next turning our attention to the supplement, Hopkins Academy. Um, program of studies with the new uh, innovation pathway information and the official designation, Annie. Yes, so as you know, and it's been highlighted in the Gazette, thank you very much to the Gazette for providing information to the community about these new programs at Hopkins Academy. 
Um, we need to now add these, this information to the program of studies. So as you know, we have two new innovation pathways, one in clean energy and another in information sciences. And because we're adding this to the program of studies, which you approve, I'm requesting that you approve that the supplemental information be included. We will not be including the letter from Desi that was just for the public and the school committee. Excellent, thank you. Do I hear a motion to add the clean energy um, and information sciences uh, innovation pathways to the program of studies as a supplement. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 And congratulations to the entire team who um, helped earn these two um, designations. I cannot emphasize enough how. Um, how important these are. Clean energy and information sciences are uh, really important and growing areas. And having our students have internships and experiences um, in these fields is really going to set them up well for our future. So thank you to the entire uh, team at um, Hadley Public Schools. Did great. great. I'm at a, a clean energy conference right now in New Orleans, thousands of people. So it's uh, just getting bigger. Oh, wow. Can you line up some virtual internships for our students while you're there? <laughs> totally. Yeah, I, will. I don't know about New Orleans, but uh, maybe around us. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Terrific. Okay, moving on to item F. This is a discussion and vote on the uh, SOA plan, Annie. Student Opportunity Act, this is when uh, the legislature amended the uh, school finance law, the Mass General Law over school finance chapter 71. Um, I did not provide the entire grant workbook because of it's hosted on the web in a grant portal for the department, but you have in your packet the summary. Hadley Public Schools, the town of Hadley does not get a significant amount of money under the changes to the Student Opportunity Act because Hadley Public Schools is in what's called hold harmless. What the town gets is roughly $30 per pupil in additional funding. That comes to just over $14,000. We, um, you're required as part of the legislation to identify an evidence-based practice as defined by the state that you will implement um, and apply your SOA funds toward. Uh, one of those evidence-based practices are high quality college and career pathways. So we use our funding to um, toward the salaries of those people who support these programs. That's And it is required by law that the school committee votes this. I will tell you it was due on April 1st. And so I made sure it was submitted. Desi does know that you're voting after the fact on it. Um, but it is required by law, and I have to report to them if for some reason uh, you decide to um, not vote on it if vote no. Thank you, Annie. Do I hear a motion to approve the Student Opportunities Act plan as outlined by Annie? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Terrific. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we are moving on to item G, Hopkins Academy Open House on April 25th. Annie. Yes, and if you don't mind, Humera, I'll just briefly touch on the open house and the school choice enrollments. Uh, at Hopkins Academy at Hadley Elementary School, we still do open house in the fall. Some of the families really enjoy getting to know their children's teachers. And we've moved Hopkins Academy to the spring because now we can, uh, we have, as you see in the next agenda item, um, it's up to our, our school choice applications that we've received are up to 40 right now. So we have invited all of those families um, in this, all the Hopkins families in this case, and anybody, our HES families also that are choicing and are welcome to come to the Hopkins over open house. We try very hard to do something different. So you see that there are different sessions that families can go to talking about how small schools support all learners and how we are able to individualize education. We have a jazz band demo. Um, we have Ms. Sear and Mr. Simmons and a representative from Greenfield Community College talking about early college high school and innovation pathways. We have presentations on restorative justice and um, social emotional learning and support. And as I said earlier, uh, international travel and service learning opportunities at Hopkins. Uh, in addition, 
uh, giving people time to visit their children's classrooms. So it's really learning about all of the opportunities that um, students have who come to Hopkins. Um, and again, we really, I, I thank every single family that chooses Hadley Public Schools. Thank you very much for our school choice families who have submitted applications for 2025. As you can see, uh, we had 40 applications so far that we've received. Uh, we have currently 10 seniors who are choice receiving. So they, they choice into our district from another district. If all 40 of these families um, decided to attend Hadley Public Schools, we would be looking at a net gain in school choice of 30 families at this point next year, which is fantastic. And that is a tribute um, to our governance, meaning our school committee that supports investments in really high quality programs, but it's really a tribute to the leadership in our buildings and to our teachers and uh, all the clubs they advise and everything they do and to our students because most students do a shadow day at Hadley Elementary School and Hopkins Academy. Students, um, I think when students go and do a shadow day, they're really deciding are these, are these people I wanna hang out with every day? And so thank you to our students for making this a place that other students wanna come to. That's thank it. you, Annie. That's excellent, 40 additional applications. That's, that's a terrific uh, uh, number. And uh, this open house program looks fantastic. I think, uh, I think I'm going to be attending um, because it just, there's so much here that I wanna learn and, and know about too. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Any questions or comments for any about either the open house or the school choice seats? One question and one comment. Um, so for the open house, did we um, add, present this to the sixth grade class too, or I don't even know if it is used to be considered in fifth grade for them to kind of attend and excitement. Yes, I want to yeah, I want to say yes, we did do that. Um, we've done a lot. So, you know, of other things like going down to sixth grade and talking to them about yeah. here's the counseling team, here's what you can expect, here's all the clubs. So, I do believe that we did, but I will double okay. check that with them. Yeah. It's just exciting, I think, for kids to, when you, especially when you have kind of that agenda up, for kids to be able to kind of roam through and explore, if, especially if they're on the fence. Um, just making sure that they know it's welcome and open um, as well. And I will be there um, representing um, the PTOs. And I'll probably be there with the Mother's Club as well. So both Tara and I were there last year and it was, it was very well done. Fun. Yep. It was fun. Yeah. It was great. So hopefully fun. a lot of people will attend. Excellent. Thank you. Tara, did, did you have some, you, I thought you had two things. You done? Oh, those were my two things. Yeah. Perfect. Asking about, yeah. And then yeah. that I would be there. So I, I'm just curious, Annie, your perspective on the, I mean, clearly as a parent, you'd, you'd want to get your kid in early. So that's why we see such a, a jump in kindergarten. But is that the only reason? Or is there another reason why we see so many people interested in kindergarten? I would say, I mean, again, across the board, I feel as though our teachers, our schools, and our students have a really fine reputation. Um, of course, I know that I'm biased, but really, we can also think about, you know, some of the awards I brought in, I, I've brought in, that's good, people want to come to the school district. <laughs> for English. You've brought them for English. Yeah. Don't worry, I'm not teaching your kids. So. Christine, uh, is that, was that proper, Christine? Yes, <laughs> dying right now. I have brought to your attention examples of even whether it's coaches from other districts and umpires and just how many times people comment on our students and just how wonderful they are. So I think overall there's a wonderful reputation. And I will say Hadley Preschool and our early ed has a really phenomenal reputation. And that is about the people, that team working there. It's about the friends of Hadley Pre-K who do a phenomenal job. So I think there is a lot of energy around early ed and that is a community-wide team effort. And those parents that do all that heavy lifting in that friends of program and um, that team. So I think that's another reason that you see a lot of uh, energy in early ed. And I think, I think it's also that if the kids start in kindergarten, they they 
grow with the class. I mean, they, they, you know, their full experience is straight through. Um, and that's, you know, it, 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 you can, you can see how that would be beneficial to have the kids begin with their class and, and continue on. So that might be, th- you know, some of the thinking behind starting in kindergarten. Yeah, that makes sense. So many amazing things about our kindergarten and our elementary school. I mean, how many have um, Spanish programs for elementary schools? It's the first that I've heard of. Um, so uh, very, very proud of our uh, our schools. And I'm not surprised that we, our enrollment uh, applications are up. Um, and great job to the team that um, just provides excellent education and excellent experience. And um, and thank you mm-hmm. for that. All right, great. Um, so no items to, no actions to vote on for either of these things. We're gonna move to next to item I, which is the DESE Special Education Civil Rights Audit of Hadley Public Schools, Annie. Just briefly, more great news. I say often that I would like Hadley Public Schools to be the destination district for families of students with disabilities. In our most recent uh, DESE audit of our special education, and it's and it also included uh, a civil rights audit. Uh, we were in compliance on all things. There were absolutely no findings and no corrective actions. You have. Uh, a special education staff that it are superstars, and you have a director of special education, Celia Snow, that is just hits the ball out of the park. So um, we're quite fortunate. And I know I'd sent this to you all, but I wanted to acknowledge Celia, our special education uh, team writ large, and all of our staff and administrators who ensure that we um, create environments where students with disabilities are included, their rights are protected, and the civil rights of all are protected. Congratulations to the whole team. This is incredible, this document that you've provided, 23 pages of requirements to comply with and to have uh, no findings um, and and to be have a completely clean audit. This is um, it's quite a feat. We're very proud. So thank you, thank you so much. And thank you, I, I'm, Yamara. I'm, I've been on school committee nine years. I know you've been on longer. I don't think I've ever seen this, or there was nothing, nothing on the report. So yeah, I'll... I don't I don't recall seeing it either. Annie, how often does this happen? Every three years, I think you're in a cycle, and there's mid cycles. Um, and, uh, yes, so this is year 10 for me and there have always been corrective actions. This is the first time that there've been absolutely none. Impressive. Yeah. Wow. That's very impressive. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Okay. Um, we're going to move next to item J updated capital plan. Okay. Um, so I have, um, added the updated capital plan to your meeting package. Um, it, it really just kind of color codes items for the past couple of years and next year um, into it, whether they're completed or not, those are the items in green. If they're in progress, that means that we've gotten estimates for them and, and we're just waiting for the vendor to be able to come and do them. Um, there were a couple of items that were canceled um, just because we were told that they didn't really need um, to do these things. Um, One of them, for example, um, adding ventilation and air conditioning units to data and custodial closets. Um, And and that was kind of determined in in speaking with Steve, our IT director, who said that we didn't really need ventilation in the data closets because there were no um, heat producing items in the closet, just switches, um, which didn't produce any heat. So they didn't really need to be cooled. And, um, you know, the custodial closets, if you can imagine your typical kind of hallway closet with a very narrow door, they don't go in very deeply. So you're, you're talking a sink and some mops and, uh, you know, not not really something that requires uh, cooling. So it was just kind of determined that, boy, we don't really need that. We moved it way out um, into 2031-32 um, and marked it in red with, you know, canceled with a question mark because, 
it, it didn't seem to be really something that was needed. Um, we also had um, a couple of items, let's see, new funding. Oh, I guess I don't have any, <laughs> I take that back, I'm sorry, of new funding needed. Right now we don't, we don't have any of those. Um, but I did just kind of move items up and down on the uh, report because they were uh, they were kind of spread around. And, and if you see, like, if you look at all of the HVAC um, items, for example, are now together and they're all in the same year and they all have a black box around them so that we know, um, you know, these items are going to be taking place really all at the same time. It wouldn't make much sense to, you know, say, do the pneumatic controls one one year and then uh, the boilers in another, We're, you know, as we know with the energy project, that's all going to be one project. And so the adjustments were made just really to uh, to represent that they're one project. Uh, I think another item are um, the bricks. Uh, we have rebuild top of chimney. We did the south end of the building last year, um, but, you know, recock expansion and control joints, exterior masonry needs to be repointed and the brick retaining wall next to the bus drop off. And um, we just decided again, that why wouldn't we just have somebody that could come and quote for all of these jobs at once and take care of them all at the same time. Uh, we just might get, because it's a larger job, we might get something that, um, you know, price-wise it would just be better. It's a bigger job. It's easier for a contractor to come and know that they're going to do four jobs than to have them come four separate times bringing all their tools and equipment each time. Uh, you know, certainly there's cost involved in that, just loading trucks and bringing everything here. Um, so those were the changes really that were made and off to the to the right. I just put comments, um, you know, like moved from FY24, say for some of them, or moved after the H, uh, HVAC project for something like the ceiling tiles, because unfortunately we just can't do that beforehand. Otherwise we'll be taking them down to run the ductwork. So. Um, this was really just a, an attempt to um, schedule things more appropriately, um, given that we had these, you know, the, the HVAC project, the, the big one, um, that really affected a number of these items, and, and we thought it would be better to just put them all together. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate the bundling of like projects. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, not only for us to wrap our head around what those projects are, but also I think you you ended up moving things from years uh, that had a like category. I really appreciate that, um, that the way you did that. Um, I do have a question about the HVAC list of um, funds. Those are funds to execute on the plan that we originally had, which was to replace our steam boilers with steam boilers. It's not a new plan because we have not yet approved that. Just clarifying question there. Uh, well, yes, those are, I mean, it, I wasn't really sure how to handle something like that. We're not going to replace them with new steam boilers. We're going to be replacing them with the geothermal heat, assuming of course that that, that works out, you know, the way we expect it to. Um, right. But for the time being, until we got the plans that actually got everything approved, I thought it was best to just keep them there, but put them in line with the rest of the HVAC projects. Absolutely. Terrific. Any other questions or comments for Chris on the capital report? I just appreciate the amount of work that went into doing this and being a visual person. I think this was, this is a great way for me to you know, see how everything's going. It's perfect. Yeah, second. The laying out a lot of this as well compared to past renditions. This is, I, I love the, the living document. Mm -hmm. yeah, cool. um, I had one question. Before, did we have the um, school choice funding for the 100,000 for the playground on here? Did we not have it on there? Um. I'm trying the only to reason find... I ask, because I know it was school choice, so I was just curious because we have some school choice on here. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I can't find it, which bothers the heck out of me. Is it toward the top of the report? Um, no, I don't see it. That's my question. Oh. <laughs> I thought you had it on there before. 
Okay, I'd have to look at prior versions. I don't believe I took anything out, and certainly not that that we know um, is going to be on there. So I can certainly check past versions, and if not, uh, again, because this document can change so often and, and so quickly, I can add that in. Um, th that's not a problem there at all. I guess that would explain why I couldn't see it, because... Uh, yeah, yeah, and I think... Perhaps maybe where you remember seeing it, Tara, is we did post up um, the Excel spreadsheet about uh, school choice encumbrances. That might be where current I saw balances could be, and yeah. what we've encumbered money for. So, yeah. but it does make sense to add it and we can bring that back at a future meeting. But I'm sure that's where you saw it and it was never yeah. on the capital plan. Um, but we can add it. Yeah, you did. yeah you're, I think you're right. Okay. Also, Thank you know, you. if you. If the committee um, just gives me the okay, I like to keep the town um, informed of any changes, any reschedulings or anything. So I'd love to be able to share this, uh, you know, with the, the town manager and, uh, you know, the town accountant, the town treasurer, just so they have this kind of on their radar. They should probably vote it because it's been amended. So it's on there sure. to vote. I think that we should vote it tonight and then bring it back, of course, and we'll add the new additional playground line item when you have that um, added as well. Any other questions or comments on this um, from a school committee deliberation standpoint? Okay, and I'm gonna ask Joyce. I see Joyce has her hand raised. Joyce, do you have a comment on this? Um, I don't know if I missed it or not, but where are we on the locker rooms where we voted on that last fall and approved? Um, did I miss that in your report, Chris? It's uh, it's on here. Uh, yes, yeah, I believe it's row 56, renovate and repurpose girls locker room areas. Yes. And then row 57 is the boys locker room. It's, a, it's there, Joyce. Oh, and I don't have... I didn't yeah, have that in front of me. Yeah, just so, a brief update. Is that what you're looking for, Joyce? Just a quick yes. Yes, please. Just so that so that the public can hear where we might be with that. Um, so the designer has been selected. I am just working on finishing up. I just got the pricing uh, from them. You know, kind of a pricing schedule. We want this percent at this point of the project. This percent at this point. Um, mm -hmm. along with uh, somewhat of a schedule that they're going to meet with us to see what we want in the locker rooms. Um, I'm incorporating all that into the into the contract document. I expect to have that to them um, probably by Thursday of this week. Okay. Do you have a committee for that that's working with you, Chris, on, on redesigning the locker rooms? Or are you just going to leave that for the design team? Did Does other people like uh, um, Fred and others, uh, coaches, have an idea of what they want? Yes. Um, so what we're going to do is it's going to be like a kickoff meeting with the designers. They will come to the school. They're going to uh, view the locker rooms and see the challenges uh, that they're facing, certainly with space space, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and other challenges that are there. Um, and at that meeting, we will have the gym teacher, uh, the athletic director, the facilities director, and myself um, in attendance. Um, we're expecting to use a small portion of the locker room for storage for the facilities department um, off to the side of, of one of them. So it's good to have all of those people there. Uh, Fred, of course, will speak with the coaches ahead of time to, to see what individual coaches might need. Um, but that's that's the plan at this point in time. Yeah, I know the boys locker room was larger than the girls locker room for sure. It it was larger. Um, it's the boys' <laughs> locker room that will be losing some of the space for facility storage. Okay. All right. Thank you. I was just wondering where it was. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do I hear a motion to approve the capital plan as presented? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, motion passes. Thank you very much, everyone. And moving on to the business manager report, Chris. All right, so I have three items for you tonight uh, to present. The first one, boy, I have so many things open here. Let's see. The expense report is the first one. Um, a number of grant transfers were made. There's still a few more to go. Um, and I just wanted to explain um, a, a couple of items here. Um, not really items in the report, but I guess showing up in the total. 
So at this point in time, we have about $2.1 million left, which is pretty much right in line with what we need for the remainder of the pay uh, payrolls that we have, um, as well as the encumbrances that we have. Um, we did send out an email today, uh, essentially closing off spending for FY24 as of this coming Friday. Uh, usually, and, and of course, in the email, I did mention that, you know, obviously, if you have a need such, you know, something like toner or copy paper, please know we don't want you to go without this stuff. But at this point in time, you know, it's the end of April. Most purchases, uh, you know, have already been made, uh, certainly to get us through the end of the year. And what this allows us to do is to close out all of these POs, you know, run them out. So we're not looking at the end of the year with 75 purchase orders still open of varying amounts. Um, and so a lot of the, when I transfer expenses to the grants, um, you know, a lot of times we don't know how much the grant is going to be when the budget is prepared and when we create some of the initial purchase orders. So items like special ed tuition, for example, the encumbrance is in the general fund, um, even though we are going to place the expense in the grant or in circuit breaker. So we actually have slightly more than the $2.1 million that you see on the report. We have encumbrances that as soon as the expense hit and the encumbrance gets reduced, I'm transferring it over to the grant. Um, so it's actually a little bit higher than that. So it gives us a little bit of cushion. Um, but nevertheless, I just wanted to point that out. So you didn't get surprised if after a month comes by or something and gee, you're still at the same total you were last month. Um, you know, that's that just explains why we're at that uh, particular level. Great. Thank you. Any questions for Chris on this? All right. And the revolving account, I see lunch has bounced back. <laughs> Thankfully, yes. Um, it has come back to a $30,000 balance. Uh, I, you know, if you look at last year's, you can see that. Uh, you know, we ended the year with 53, then we dropped a little bit, you know, as some more June expenses came through in July. And then in August, we got uh, a couple of payments that uh, that bumped us way up. Usually, over, you know, there are a couple of months behind the state is in uh, giving us uh, reimbursements. So what will happen is, you know, we'll see something somewhat similar to that um, happening over this summer, you know, where we'll get a bump up with no expenses. but uh, revenues coming in. So, uh, you know, hopefully, I mean, if we can just finish the year or or start next year at around the same $53,000 level, that would be, you know, pretty good for us because we had some major expenses this year. Um, and if I can just kind of dovetail off that for a second, uh, apparently, from what I've been told, the flavor stations at the, uh, certainly at Hopkins, uh, has been a major hit with the students. Um, they absolutely love it is, is the feedback I was told. And um, I know at HES, there was, there was a little bit of a, a delayed start at HES. It will uh, begin soon, uh, but we moved somebody over to that school and because the cooking was being done there and, you know, I mean, just there, it was kind of starting it from scratch. It hadn't, cooking hadn't been done there in a while. So they delayed uh, the launch of the flavor station at that school. But yeah, you know, I mean, it, it's so nice to, uh, to see feedback come back with uh, with positive results. So, uh, you know, very happy for them. And uh, I can go back to the revolving equipment uh, report now. Um, student activity got a bump up, you know, basically field trips were being uh, deposited into and had not been expensed out yet. So we got a little bit of a, an increase in the student activity. The Hadley Kids account is, is doing very well, uh, 41,000. I did uh, transfer the um, about two thirds of the budgeted amount of school choice expenses. I don't really anticipate more. That's that's what I plan on right now, uh, barring any unforeseen circumstances where um, I think we've done all of the expenses to school choice that we're going to have to do. Uh, so that's certainly a good sign. Um, and uh, and that's pretty much it for the revolving account. I don't know if anyone has any questions there. Uh, no questions, but a comment. Uh, I heard from my daughter that the um, flavor station was was mobbed, um, and is is a big hit. So congratulations! Whatever you're doing is is working. Yeah, it was great to hear that. It truly was. Any other thoughts 
Just on the, the school choice of that 1.9, that's after you made the withdrawal? That's correct. Uh, we had about, I think, 600000 of expenses um, went to school choice. We budgeted, I believe, nine, nine or 925. I don't remember exactly, but it was one or the other. Okay. Thanks. Uh, right. Something. It's a quick comment. Um, yes, um, I'm excited to get some feedback from the elementary school about the flavor stations. And I did get feedback. They do Papa John's pizza on Friday. And my fifth grader did come home after the first week and said, uh, there was a snafu and there was a delay in pizza for a lot of kids. So you might want to look into that. And I had luckily already been aware from it from, <laughs> from an email, but in, in, and I know resolution and I could have, I could assure him and his his other fifth grade friends that have already worked out a, a plan, but they love the pizza. Yeah, apparently the uh, road work caused quite the delay in the pizza <laughs> being delivered. Um, again, something that was unforeseen, uh, certainly by us and also by Papa John's. So, yeah. um, you know, we just suggested that they might find an alternate route to the school. Um, during the road construction phases. So um, that's, you know, again, sometimes the, the best laid plans still have problems presented uh, and this was one of them, but you know, as long as there's a solution. Indeed. Okay, moving on to the grant allocations. Okay, so um, this is the grant report. Um, as you can see, there's significantly more expense from the grant than there was uh, the last one. I did a very large number of journal entries to move expenses over to the grant. A um, couple things I just wanted to point out. Uh, the second grant on here, the ESSER three grant, you can see we have $270,000 remaining. That needs to be expended by, actually not expended, but um, planned expenses, I guess. We need to have it encumbered or spent by September 30th of this year. Um, which will be fine because 250 of that is for the uh, HVAC design work. Uh, and then I still have to do another 20,000 of expense transfers over, um, which will be done this month. So, um, I, you know, it just looked like a huge amount. And I just wanted you to be aware that there's nothing to worry about. We will have it fully spent. Um, the other one is a little, I guess it's a, about maybe almost two thirds of the way down. The 332 grant you can see is actually negative. Um, it's not, I did the journal entries after I ran this report and I forgot to go back and change it, but I moved the expenses out of the grant, uh, and, and back to where they belong. So that is no longer in the negative. So, um, I just wanted to point those two items out. I can answer any questions you may have. Great. Thank you. Questions for Chris. No questions. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. And we just had one other item, and that was the warrants. Um, Anne and I met last week, I think it was to work on grants, and we just quickly went over the school committee agenda. And um, and she said, are we missing anything? And I said, you know what I haven't seen in a while? Our, our warrant approvals on the, um, on the agenda. So I need to go back and just um, look at when the last time we actually voted them, and then I'll, I'll you know, put something together so that you know exactly what you need to vote on to approve them. Um, but yeah, we need to, you know, get that caught up. Um, I'm also a little behind in sending them out to Ann and Ethan to sign. So you'll be getting a, a decent amount of warrants. So get your mouses ready, oh, mice, I guess, mice ready um, to, uh, to approve those. That's good. Right, I just thank you. Let me say for the parents again, neither Chris nor I will be teaching your children English, so you're good. I did <laughs> learn from Anne on uh... rottening mouses. <laughs> okay, technically I have to chime in, you know, I'm going to have to, but um, when it comes to computer equipment, it is technically correct to say mouses, not mice. All right, yeah. just like with oh, the lunch thing. I knew that. Started. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, I see how it is. That makes sense, okay. Excellent. You brought, you brought Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, we look forward to seeing an update on the warrants next month and signing and, and taking care of that housekeeping. Appreciate you uh, bringing that to our attention. All right. Um, any final questions on the business manager report for Chris? 
Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Okay, we're going to scan our action items. I believe we have voted on uh, approved everything. We are, except for E, um, do I hear a motion to approve the school committee minutes from March 25th? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Excellent. Um, onward to school committee updates and general announcements. Um, Tara, tell us about uh, a playground, CPAC, and CES. Go backwards because it's quicker. Um, so CES, I just sent that out to you guys. I apologize. I'm bad at sending out. Um, so we will not have another meeting until May, but I sent out the um, director's um, report that goes through a little bit of what's been going on at CES. And the last meeting um, that I went to in March, we spent um, a good amount of time reviewing um, the director's um, um, evaluation and kind of how we could improve it. So um, that was a nice informative discussion and it's always nice to hear kind of what's been going on. What thinking. It's not too long of a document. It's a pretty quick read if you want to read through it. Um, you know, overall, everyone provides a lot of really, um, really good feedback um, to the director there. So I find it just to be really, even if you don't have a lot to add as far as feedback, um, it's informative to listen in on people's um, So that's CES. So I won't have um, another update on that um, until probably um, probably June, because the May meeting will happen after our after our um, school committee meeting in May. Um, CPAC. There is a next CPAC meeting. They did not meet last month. That meeting got canceled. There's another meeting this coming. Friday, um, where I believe they're going to finalize their bylaws and um, create a um, create an agenda and schedule of what the following school year is going to look like. And I think they're going to assign officers as well. Um, so I'll have a report for next month of that. And I'd be happy to also share their, their schedule of planned events as soon as they have that kind of finalized. Um, and then the playground. I did forget, again, to send this out to Annie, so I'll send this to her, so you'll have it in the documents for April, and I'll do um, a May update as well, but just to verbally tell you, um, last time we were about to receive the check from Steve Lewis Subaru, and we did um, receive a $25,000 check from Steve Lewis Subaru, um, we will get the remainder of that um, in the fall, I believe. Um, for the next share of the law. So we did we did receive that. We have that on hand. Um, we are working to follow up with some donors that have um, graciously agreed to pledge a donation, but we have yet to receive those. So we're following up with those. Um, I did speak with the board at um, a few of the board members for the PTO um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and Helping Hearts um, um, organization dissolved, they took a, approximately, I don't know these, but approximately $8,000 um, that they had left in their account um, and donated it to the PTO with the stipulation that um, the money would be divided in half um, and half of it would go to the high school and half of it would go to the elementary school. Um, I had a conversation with um, the board, um, and while $4,000 to high school is absolutely wonderfully fantastic, um, the projects that are going on there are quite large um, comparative to how a $4,000 um, donation would go toward would go just a lot farther, <laughs> excuse me, than um, it would at the high school. So they did actually ask if the entire donation approximately, I don't know exactly, approximately $8,000, it could be a little over, could go towards the playground project. And they did receive um, approval from that helping her board that we could use that um, money. So that money will get added to the pot of donated funds. Um, the last time we met as a group for fundraising, we decided that we're going to have a table at the Asparagus Festival 
Um, so we'll be talking on Wednesday of what that's going to look like, gaining awareness, um, doing some fun uh, game type activities. One parent had the idea of doing um, asparagus bowling, where your bowling pins are asparagus. Um, and mm. asking for like a donation or something to to do that. So we're going to talk a little bit more about logistics on on Wednesday, what that will look like. Um, the group also would really like to do bingo night. Um, and so the logistics of that being worked out, the when, the where, the how are still in process. We're going to try and narrow some of that down as well. Um, and then the, the potential of that bingo night kind of turning into um, something that happens um, maybe a little bit more frequently taken on by PTO and having it be kind of a community-wide event and trying to um, incorporate kind of the greater community outside of just our school communities, more than just parents and teachers and whatnot, but trying to reach um, others in the community. Um, so what else did I not tell you? Um, so we, um, Jen and I did meet with... Um, a vendor for the playgrounds. Um, we are going to be getting two different um, estimates and sketches in. I've been in talks with um, owner for the for the vendor group that um, we decided to use, and so we are anticipating that within the next week we're going to have um, uh, um, pretty good sketches of what the ideas of the playground would look like from both um, both playground vendors. Um, as well as associated costs, um, that will help us kind of narrow down exactly how much we really need to have. Um, and I have spoken with the Friends of Hadley Preschool um, board members last month, and we had a, a discussion about how we could go about looking to seek a donation from them um, that would cover the costs of the pre-KK playground. Um, and so where we landed on that was it would be helpful to them to have um, a more precise number um, of what that would look like. So as soon as I get those estimates back, um, they're going to be presented to the Friends of Hadley Preschool um, with the goal of seeking uh, an entire uh, fully funded donation that would cover the entire cost of the so um, I think they'll be able to better answer that once they know exactly kind of um, what they're getting. Not they, it's not theirs, but what would be received and for what cost. So um, I'm very hopeful that next month I will be able to tell you that they have donated the entire cost of that. Um, and any funds that we've raised this far will be able to go to one through six playground. And hopefully next month I can also show you guys um, images proposals on too, which will be exciting. That's excellent progress, Tara. Thank you so much. Um, huge thanks to, uh, not not prematurely, but the Hadley, um, Friends of Hadley Preschool have been so uh, dedicated and passionate and we're really excited to uh, to work with them again on this project. So thank you for forging that partnership and um, really, really glad to hear that that's coming along well. Look forward to uh, more developments next month. Um, moving on to finance, I will just uh, remind everyone to please come to annual town meeting, not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, May 1st at Hopkins Academy. Or May 1st, Wednesday. It's mm. not Thursday. Annual town meeting? First Thursday? First Thursday? Did I just, sorry, if I have this messed up, let me just check really quickly. Joyce, you want to chime in? It's the first Thursday? Correct. Here, I'm mute my, I gotta mute myself. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, May yes. 2nd is the town meeting. Thank you. It is May the first 2nd. Yes. First, May 2nd. First, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it is. Thank you so much. Okay, so, and that is a 7 p.m. start? Yes. All right, so thank you. Not this Thursday, but the following Thursday, May 2nd at 7 p.m. at the um, Hopkins Academy. Um, and please be sure to attend not only to participate in our important institution of annual town meeting, but also to help vote in the school budget, um, which is very, very important. Um, so thank you. Um, and Joyce, don't go far because I'll be uh, uh, calling on you in just a moment. Um, 
but we're going to keep moving forward. We're almost done with this agenda. Um, Paul, you gave us an update on fields. Is there anything else you want to say about that? Okay. Now we're good. All right, thank you. And um, Christine Pip, we um, approved the capital plan as it stands today. Is there anything else you want to say about that? No, we're good to go. Okay, great. And Ethan, we heard about the policy discussion on um, the recognition and naming strategy. Um, did the policy committee have any other updates? That was really the focus for today's meeting. Okay, excellent. Well, given that we're at the end of our um, agenda and we do not have an executive session, I would like to um, make two brief uh, announcements. Um, we should add back in the announcements section of our agenda, just, yes. Um, so the first is um, I wanted to um, extend on behalf of the school committee our um, deepest condolences to the Ginsburg family on the passing of Beth Ginsburg, an important, um, you know, mom in our community and just beloved by so many. Um, and uh, we're just so sad to hear about her passing. And um, on an entirely different note, um, this may or may not be the last school committee meeting that has Joyce Chunglo on it as our select board representative. And um, I wanted to start by saying how much we have appreciated your participation in all of our meetings and just, uh, you know, popping up a level, your commitment and volunteerism in the town as a school committee member and now as select board. I haven't seen what I heard is a glowing article in the paper about you, um, and I'm not surprised. Um, we're going to miss you, and um, I'd like to propose something super cheesy on behalf of our school committee. I'd like to propose a three cheers, a hip hip hooray for Joyce Chungalo. It sure beats a plaque or a recognition, um, and it's super cheesy, but hopefully an expression of our gratitude for you. And uh, so on the count of three, one, two, three. Hip hip hooray. Hey, Joyce. Hip hip hooray. Hip hip hooray. There you go. Love um, you, Joyce. <laughs> you know, I, I want to say thank you so much. I uh, wished I was able to attend more meetings, but with executive sessions popping up so often lately and always on a Monday night, I uh, have felt bad that I, I really wanted to skip the executive meetings and come to your select board meetings. Um, but I, I want to say that, you know, from day one, when I was, I, I was on school committee to now moving out of, of my uh, political arena, I will always, always have the school department as one of my most cherished um, times in politics. Um, not only have my kids gone through the system, I've seen so many children flourish um, that uh, they are our backbone of our community. And I have always said that, you know, what we put into our education is what we will get back in the long run. So um, you will always have my support, whether or not I'm on a committee or not, I will always stand up for the school department and um, you have been certainly uh, a wonderful school committee, um, those that are on it and what you do for our community, how you have moved the school department from when I was on it to what it is now. Um, it's just been outstanding and you have great leadership and Dr. McKenzie and all of your teachers and everybody, including yourselves. So um, I just truly appreciate everybody that participates in our school department because it is top of the line as far as I'm concerned in this Western Mass. Absolutely. Thank you, Joyce. Way to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to miss you. And we, we know that you're not going far. So uh, thank you for continuing to be an advocate of the schools. We, we and, will likely be. If you need somebody you. on a committee for something, <laughs> I can available to whatever. So keep that in mind also. Consider thank that. you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Our next meeting dates are, uh, let's see, May 20th. There will be a 4.30 policy subcommittee, followed by a 5.30 regular school committee. Um, so see you all on May 20th. Do I hear a motion to adjourn this meeting? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.